The title of the sermon today is The Giver of Eternal Life. And the scripture reading will be from John 10, 22 to 30. And Robert Collins uh, will do the scripture reading for us today. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered him, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. These are the words of Jesus to the disbelieving audience. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us your inspired word to reveal to us who you are and who the Father is. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> you know, Jesus, as we read the scripture, uh, we read about the fact that Jesus went to the temple as the Jews were celebrating the Feast of Dedication or known today as Hanukkah or the Feast of Lights. And this feast is still celebrated today, of course, by the Jews. And it's commemorates the rededication of the temple by Judas Maccabeus in 164 BC. And as you remember the story, the, or the fact, the historical fact is that the Roman had, had desecrated the temple. And uh, so uh, Judas Maccabeus uh, had rededicated to God. And this feast is, was in the winter. It's, uh, it always falls around Christmas time. Um, but the time setting of the scripture that we have just read is about two and a half months after the teaching of Jesus on being the good shepherd. And Jesus in this, in this passage of scripture is talking to a disbelieving audience. The religious leaders at the time wanted a way to kill Jesus and to get rid of him. And in, the, in addressing this disbelieving audience, Jesus is very direct in telling them who they are and who they are not. And today we'll stop and think about Jesus' conversation with these Jews uh, during, during the sermon. We will also consider what that means for us today, because the word of God is living. It's a living word, and it has been preserved for all generation of Christians. So it says it's relevant today as it was back then for all of us. And, and, and we need the, the, the primary purpose of the Bible, of course, is to reveal who God is. That is the central point of the word of God, of the, revel of the, of the reveal word of God, to, for us to come to know who, who God is. So the question and the answer to who Jesus is, is, as, is an important one. And one day, all people will be confronted with who Jesus is. And we read about that in quickly in that everyone will meet Jesus uh, in, Philippi, in Romans 14, 10 to 12. We read, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. And every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. So there's, there's coming a time for each and every one of us and for every human being that they will stand and that they will bow down before the living Jesus Christ. And give an account of their life. And really, at that time, what is very, very important is will be our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. So you see that as we consider this conversation today, it's very, very important because it is as relevant today as it was back to 
back then when Jesus addressed um, the audience back then. And of course, we are privileged in his church to have the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit gives us understanding of what Jesus is saying. And at that time, the audience said, did not understand as, as, we, as we will see. So Jesus by, begins by telling them who they are not. He says, Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe the words that I do in my father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. So the Jews gathered around Jesus and asked him how long he would keep them in suspense uh, that he was to tell them, are you really the Christ? Are you really the Messiah? And Jesus did not answer them directly. He reminded them that he had told them. And at that time, they did not believe. And he begins by telling them clearly that the work he has been doing in the name of God the Father bears witness to who he is. And he began to talk about them, about the very close and responsive relationship he has with God the Father as he lived his life here on earth as a human being. And Jesus then goes on to tell them about the consequences of not believing him because they are not a part of his flock. And consequently, not being a part of his flock, they do not recognize Jesus. And not recognizing who Jesus is leads to leads those contemporary Jews, the Jews that lived at the time when Jesus was ministering on the earth, to reject him. And they had a hateful, murderous attitude towards Jesus. Of course, not all of them, but many of them at the time, and especially among the religious leaders, and as, as we see in the last, before the crucifixion, the crowds turn against, the crowds uh, turn against him as well. But not recognizing Jesus, there was blindness in their eyes. And in their minds, they, they, they did not recognize him. And this is what caused the blindness in their eyes. And Jesus, of course, does not mince words in telling them who, are, who they are not because he tells them rec not recognizing who Jesus is has left them with a hardness of heart. Their heart has become hard and not believing they were left with their stony heart. And we know why Jesus came to the earth. He came to the earth to change people's heart. And we read about that in Ezekiel 36 to 26. I'll just read it to you. It says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So Jesus is coming to the earth to, to make us as the human beings we were met, meant to be. That is why he came to completely transform us. And Jesus knew very well when he came to the earth, he, he knew very well that he would be rejected as he was. And, um, and, and we read about that, uh, John wrote about that very early on in the, the gospel, in John 1, 9 to 13, he says, he wrote the true light, which enlightens every man, what enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not, did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So, as we read these scriptures, it's very clear that unless God the Father reveals who Jesus is, there's a blindness that remains on people's eyes. And God the Father prepares us to receive Jesus by the Holy Spirit. And to know who God is, we have to turn to Jesus. There's absolutely no other way. We cannot know God by looking to, to Moses, by looking to the law, 
by looking back to Sinai or by looking at any other source. The only way to know God is to focus on Jesus and believe what he says. Because Jesus is the only one who knows God the Father. And he, he, he came to reveal him. And we read about that in the important scripture of Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. We read, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So first we need to turn to Jesus. And then Jesus reveals who the, fa who the Father is. And Jesus, because he is God, is the only one who can reveal who God is, who can reveal who the Holy Spirit is. And we have to have our minds open, not to project what we think onto God, but to accept in a very humble way, like a child, what Jesus is telling us. And as human beings, we have a great difficulty doing that because we have a tendency to project what we think on God and think that it's true. Well, that is not true. What is true is what Jesus reveals. On our own, we get a distorted view of God. So the reason that is so is that Jesus is God. And again, he came to the earth. And he came to the earth in a very humble way to serve us. And I like how the uh, Message Bible uh, tells it in, in Philippians 2, 7 to 8. It says, he lived a perfect life in our place. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave and he became human. And having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He did not claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life, and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death is that, a crucifixion. So this is what Jesus came, how Jesus came to the earth. And again, he came to the earth knowing that he would not be accepted. It was prophesied that he would be rejected and that he would die a brutal death. And we read about that in Isaiah 53 and Psalm, Psalm 22 and other places. And speaking to this unbelieving group, um, we find encouragement for us as believers because he not only tells us who they are not because they don't believe, but he also tells them who believers are as they believe in Jesus Christ. Yes, I have jumped. Just, I think I jumped up. So basically, he, he tells them who they are as believers. Uh, there's a few slides missing there. But what happens is that as he tells them that as, as his sheep, we know God and God knows us. We listen to Jesus. He's important in our life. We know that he is the good shepherd. We know who he is. And that has a tremendous impact on our life. And then as he does this, and as he tells us who we are as his sheep, as believers, he gives us tremendous promises as we shall discuss in just in, in a few minutes. But then he, he tells them who he is. And of course, they did not understand. He, he doesn't tell them that he is the Messiah, but this is what he tells them. And for the Jews, this was blasphemy. He tells them, I and the Father are one. And here, 
so how are we to believe that Jesus and the Father are one yet distinct? We cannot fully understand because God is spirit and we are not. You know, God is not physical. God is spirit. He existed before all things. We are his creation. And when we, physically speaking, when we say that we are one, it's very different than God saying that he is one. So that is why we have to receive what God, Jesus is telling us. And we have to trust in God's revelation of who he is rather than, again, project our human point of view. And, and God has created everything through Jesus Christ. And one of, when one of the members of the Trinity is involved, all of God is involved because God is one. And we read in, in Colossians 1, 16 to 17, we read, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created uh, through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So, so God, God created through Jesus Christ, and he created for Jesus Christ. Jesus is the, the giver of life. He's, he's, he's above all. He sustains everything. And we know, of course, at the end that when everything is perfected, he's going to return everything to God, the Father, in perfection. And, and um, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, and I find just to help us to know who God is, the following in illustration that describes it well. Um, so we see that God, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And we see that the Father is not the Son. The Son is not, the Holy Spirit is not the Son. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. And the Father is not the Son, yet God is one. And this is a, and again, God is spirit. And when he says that he is one, it's different than when we say as human beings, we are one. God, the, God, the, the three distinct person of the, of the Trinity indwell one another in a very special way. It's a relationship that is based on love and outgoing concern for one of the other and this, this love that God has within himself, he, it overflows to his creation. He creates everything. And the creation is different from God. Many of the false religions of this world will say that, that God, that, that somehow the creation is, that God is in all creation. God has created, has created everything, and he is different from creation. He sustains everything. And that is important to understand as well, and to understand the falsity of false religion that say that Jesus is in plants, uh, God is in plants, he's in birds, he's, he's, he's everywhere in that sense. No, he sustains everything, but he is distinct from creation. He is distinct from us. And when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, he's talking about his divinity. He is not talking about his human nature. From a divine point of view, Jesus is, is, this, is a distinct member of the one God. And from a human point of view, he is now the perfected, he has the perfected human nature. He is the perfect man. And through faith, we become united to our high priest, Jesus Christ. We do not become God as Jesus is God. In union with Jesus Christ, we stay human and distinct from Jesus. We will stay human from, from, for all eternity. And this is important. People wonder, well, how are we going to be for all eternity? We're going to be perfect, perfect human beings, united in Christ, distinct from one another, distinct from God, and united to the humanity of Jesus Christ. And the essence of who God is is captured in the Nicene Creed, and I'll just read it quickly for you, and because this is very important. 
we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty creator of heaven and earth, and all that is seen and unseen. So God, the Father, is the creator, creator of all things. He's created everything by Jesus Christ. And so when one person of the God is involved, the whole God is involved. And then in Jesus Christ, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, not made of one being with the Father. Through him, all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary. He was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. And on the third day, he arose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. And with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. And he has spoken through the prophets. And of course, we believe in one holy Catholic church, meaning not the Roman Catholic church, but the, the universal church, the apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And so this is, again, this is very important uh, to understand about who God is because it's the foundation of our faith. And believing that Jesus is God still provokes controversy today. I know that even in our congregation here, there are some who have difficulty accepting that God is, is Trinitarian. They, they, don't, they still don't believe that the Holy Spirit is God, still believe that the, somehow the Holy Spirit is a power of God. No, that's not what the, the, the universal, the, the, the church believes. That's not, the, and it's based on the evidence of God's word as well. You can find that the Holy Spirit is God as we study scripture in it with an open mind. And many people will say they believe in God. All religions believe there is a God or gods. But the crunch comes when we say and believe what Jesus says about himself, that he is God. And there are only two ways to react to Jesus. Either we believe that he is God who came down from heaven and was made man or we reject him. So what happens, everybody accepts that there is a God of somehow or gods. But when we zero down on Jesus Christ, that makes all the difference. Because Jesus is a living being. He is alive today. He has conquered death. And no other religion except for Christianity believes that Jesus is the eternal son of God. Only Christianity believes in the only giver of eternal life, who is Jesus. There is no other name under heaven by whom we can be saved. And as we read, read in the scripture today, Jesus says that he is the giver of life. He's the giver of eternal life. It is through Jesus that we receive eternal life by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is truly the center of the center. A and then Jesus, Jesus goes on and there's a difficult scripture for some where Jesus says that you are God's. And he says that in Psalm 82, God, and I'd just like to read it to you. So just to clarify what God says here, God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and to the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. So obviously, he is talking about to human beings. 
They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, son of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. So when God says you are gods, he's not saying that we will become God like God is God. Here in, in, in John 10, and here, uh, Asaf quotes God's bringing an indictment against Israel misbehaving rulers. And God accuses them of perverting justice by per favoring the wicked instead of championing the cause of the oppressed, the weak, the fatherless, the poor, the needy. These rulers clearly have conducted their responsibility without spiritual or intellectual understanding, caught up as they are in moral darkness. And I'm quoting here from Ted Johnson. Jesus quoted uh, verse 6 in defending himself against the accusation of blasphemy from Israel's rulers of his day in John 10, 34. According to Jesus, since Israel rulers were, in a sense, sons of God, he was not committing blasphemy in referring to himself as God's son, because it was not yet the time to say that he was the Messiah, because all human beings are sons and daughters of God. And we read that in, in Luke 3.38, we read the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So Adam is the son of God. All the descendants are son of God. Physically speaking, every human being is a son or a daughter of God. Spiritually speaking, however, we become adopted sons and daughters of God through faith in Jesus Christ, through faith in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. That is why Jesus is the center of the center. So as we read this, as we, as we consider that Jesus that we know God, that we are God's sheep. God knows us individually by name. He also tells us that we are secure, that no one will snatch us up from, the, from, the, from his hand or from the Father's hand. That is important to, to realize as well as we just read in the scripture. No one can snatch, snatch you or I from the Father's hand from the hands of Jesus, from the hands of the good shepherd. Our participation is keep on believing every day in Jesus Christ. We have the assurance of eternal life. And Jesus is that giver of eternal life. It means that we will never die. Jesus says that by not believing in Jesus, that, you know, those who don't, do not believe in Jesus will perish. And that word has to do with, when you look at the Greek, it has to do with destruction, loss of life. So the source of life is Jesus. And there's, that's why, you know, as Cal Maskery was saying in that little video, that it's important to present Jesus because Jesus is the door to know who God is. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, he is everything. So when we talk about Christianity to, other, to others, we must focus on Jesus Christ. He is the door. He is the entry to understanding and to knowing God. So that is important. So we can ask, well, how does this scripture apply to our life today? How do these scriptures apply to our life today? Well, there are several points. The works that Jesus did, the works of God the Father, testifies that he is truly the eternal son of God. Because he said, I and the Father are one. He also says that he is the giver of eternal life. So just by saying that he's, he gives eternal life, 
is a is is a sure knowledge that he is God that they did not understand because no one can give eternal life other than one who is eternal, and Jesus is eternal, so he can give eternal life by the Holy Spirit. That is important to to understand. So, because the Son of God is the one who gives life, every human being on the face of the earth is connected to Jesus because Jesus sustains both our physical life and the spiritual life of all those who believe in him. And being the people of God, as the people of God, as part of God's flock, Jesus will be of primary importance in our life because he tells us very clearly that he is our all in all, as, as the Apostle Paul wrote. He is our life. Jesus is our redemption. He is our Lord. He is our Savior who has undone the damage caused by the first man, Adam, by, by whom sin came into the world. And by analogy of the sheep, Sheep trust and love their shepherd. It's an analogy, it's a metaphor. Spiritually speaking, we trust Jesus for everything in our life. Because apart from Jesus, we don't have life. He sustains us physically and he gives us eternal life. And we show our love for Jesus by being submissive and obedient to his word. For example... Jesus has founded the church. The church is God's creation. So what God tells us about the church is important for us to, re to receive. It's important to receive what he tells us about our relationship with him and our relationship with other people, both in the church and outside the church. His words are important in, you know, to the mission that he has given to the church. The Bible is teaches us all these things and it's in response to grace. We become the sheep of God, not by what we do, but by accepting the gift of being made the people of God by faith. We do not create it. We respond and we receive. And since the Father is in Jesus and Jesus is in the Father, we united to demand Jesus are also included in God as human beings. Through demand Jesus, we are included in the divine life of the triune God in that we are included through demand Jesus Christ, our perfect mediator. We are included because Jesus has both divine nature and human nature and divided, undivided in himself. In Jesus Christ, we participate in the triune relationship of love. There's no higher calling. And having the assurance that we are, we are united to, in Jesus by faith, we believe that no one can snatch us out of the hand of the Father, nor out of the hand of Jesus. We believe that no one can rob us of that relationship. Our participation is to belief. And since God the Father and Jesus with the Holy Spirit are bound together by love, and since we are included in that relationship, united to Jesus, we are also united to God in that bond of love. We are valued by God. We are in that bond of love that God has in the Trinity, and the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. And this love is described in 1 Corinthians 13. Um, that's how it's going to show in our life. That love is patient. It is kind. It does not envy or boast or brag. It's not arrogance. That love is not rude. It will not insult other people. It will not. It, it's not rude. It, it's gentle. It does not insist on his own way. 
and it's not irritable or, or irritable or resentful. So we're not given because of the love of God. We are not given to um, spouts of anger and uh, or, or we, we are not resentful. And God helps us to grow in that quality as, as we abide in his word and as we abide in him. And that's why we're in grace. He, he knows we are human. We know he knows we fail, but we are united to him and we, we let his love flow in us. And, and that, that is going to show in our life. There's going to be a big change. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth. When we see what's happening in, in the wars and famines and tornadoes and all of that and, and the immorality and the sinfulness, the, the greed and the, all of that, that, that is hurting so many people because sin is hurtful. We do not rejoice at that, but we rejoice with the truth. Who is Jesus? And love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. And for knowledge, it will pass away. But love never ceases. That is why it's so very important. And the analogy of the sheep in the presence of their shepherd, we have peace. You know, we know that we are protected from potential danger. And as we sang, there are high points in our life and there are low points in our life. But whatever happens, we know that Jesus, the good shepherd, is going to see us through in the valleys. As we walk in the valley of the shadow of death and life on earth is not always easy. In fact, God told us that there would be Many tribulation as we belong to the kingdom of God. There are high points and low points. But we know that the good shepherd will see us through whatever life challenges we may face. Health, finances, whatever. We look to Jesus. So let us keep trusting in our beautiful Savior, the giver of eternal life. Amen. <laughs>